Even before I was a researcher, I was always fascinated by violence, its causes, its roots. And in this film, we're going to be considering three fundamental questions. One, is there a fixed definition of violence? Two, are there types of violence? And three, most important of all, why do people perpetrate these acts of violence? This is the anomaly of violence. The first stop on our journey takes us to Leeds to speak with violence expert Dr. Peter Trainer. Peter specialises in knife crime and domestic violence. As you know, we uh, spoke about, we're kind of on a, a journey here to, to sort of understand the the roots of violence, if you will. Um, so you're the so you're the so you're the first person that we're uh, speaking with, um, and we're kind of interested in, um, I suppose, kind of what motivates violence and you know sort of how violence is seen in public uh, how, it, how it's perceived in different forms of media and stuff so I suppose what what, what we're looking for from you obviously with, the, with your background your expertise um, one if you could maybe talk to us a little bit about your your, your background and what you obviously specialise in and, and then from there we maybe you could give us a bit of a very general kind of definition about violence. Okay. Well I've been a researcher for 20 years now uh, and a lot of that time has been spent working on projects around Violence, touched on violence, or offending, um, antisocial behaviour, um, policing of the nighttime economy. I've walked around, spent a lot of time with police officers, walking around, observing um, the way that police officers respond to things like violence and uh, criminality in the, the, the NTE. Um, my PhD was on knife crime, so I uh, interviewed a lot of young people, mainly young men, who've been involved in uh, knife crime, carrying knives. We've been arrested for night, carrying mm. knives. Well, both both knives. sides of the fence, as it were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, I suppose young people who didn't carry knives but lived in areas where there was knife crime. And I, I got them in, in groups and got them to talk about their experiences and what it's like to live in an area with a lot of violence and why they thought young people carried knives. So, so yeah, I spent a lot of time looking at and thinking about violence in lots of different ways. Yeah, I mean, it's quite, 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 you know, quite a wide base base there of, of expertise that kind of you know, I mean it's great for us because obviously you'll be you'll be able to kind of ground it really for us. So um is is there a sort of an I know I know it's probably not, but is there like an agreed kind of any sort of definitional ground that we can start with with uh, well, violence? That's, that's a good question. Yeah. And it is a heated debate yeah. in lots of ways. Um so yes and no how do we First, it's important to realise that actually not everybody is violent and that mm. a lot of violence is done by a relatively small proportion of people. Uh, and in terms of explaining violence, really, there's one set of explanations come from the wider criminological literature and, um, and the same explanations are applied to how we understand criminality and offending more generally. And that's around, you know, we have explanations of, of class, our, um, explanations relating to locality. So, you know, 100 years ago they were, they were looking at violence and offending and realised that 
finds tend to be concentrated in some areas and not others. And those areas tend to be poorer areas uh, mm. and uh, with high levels of migration, uh, high levels of poverty and de deprivation. Uh, and most of the people doing that violence tend to be young men. So already you're getting a, a way of explaining it that has to account for the fact that it's mainly violence is mainly done by young men living in poor areas. That's a lot of the violence. So those explanations were around, was it poverty? Was it um, what's called reaction formation? So was it young men, say, in a school environment encountering, um, you know, challenges, whether it was the result of their poverty, the deprivation they experienced, or their, their family background that led them to use violence functionally. And again, we have these kind of functional approaches to violence, which is violence can be useful, or it can also be expressive. So um, functionally, you know, if you're, a, if you're a poor young man and you're offered an opportunity to either work nine hours a day in a factory for the rest of your life, of the next 40 years for minimal pay mm. or you can get involved in some kind of activities that involve violence and that you might be able to enrich yourself and make money then that that suggests a kind of functional approach to explain violence so some people do violence because they're poor and they want to make money and they don't want to work in a factory it's as simple as that from 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 what you're saying it kind of seems like it's well not only much more complicated you know, much more com complicated which we would expect but it's quite um, purposeful and it, like strategic in a lot of ways. It absolutely is and I, I think I can think of a couple of examples of that in terms of one, actually we all without realising it define violence. So if you watch a boxing match, that's two men punching each other for money and therefore we don't see it as violence. It's, it, it may be physical, it, it may be physically damaging somebody, mm. but your legal, I mean it's how our legal systems work as well. If someone pays you and it's agreed that, that you're going to stand in the square or octagon ring and punch another man for money, that's perfectly acceptable. But that same behaviour in a pub is increasingly unacceptable and subject to legal sanctions. So one issue is just actually violence isn't any specific thing, it's, it's how we as a society define it. And the other thing is really, yeah, it's violence is sometimes is senseless, but rarely, I would say. Mm. There will be times where somebody will commit a senseless act of violence that they've never engaged in before um, and they may never do again and they may not be able to understand it. That's what you think of as senseless violence. But if you think of, say, uh, a group of young men who encounter you know, a couple of people on a night out and end up beating them to death, that's what the newspapers will call senseless violence. But that actually structures and, and has meaning to the people involved in that. If you take that group of young men, you will have different roles and different levels of status and hierarchy in that group. And those young men will use violence as a way of negotiating hierarchies within the group and within their wider kind of like social networks. And some of those young men will be better at violence than others. And they will attain some level of status as a result of that. Um, and so when you get this explosion, when you get, I was just reading about um, somebody who was killed recently because a group of lads had walked past him and one of them had said he looked like either Ant or Deck. Hmm. And the young guy responded by pushing one of these kids and these kids responded by basically murdering him. Um, now, that, 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 that's not a senseless act of violence. That's a group of young men who are trying to define who they are and who they are within a group. And one of them will verbally uh, uh, assault a perfect stranger um, because it gets them status within the group. If they're kind of the kind of person who likes to, you know, verbally, verbally kind of like attack people, that becomes a source of status for a group where actually they're all quite low status. It's like a, a resource. It need. is a resource, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a form of capital. Yeah. And then uh, what happens, that young man takes exception to that, responds aggressively, mm. then the rest of the group, you've got this kind of group in the out kind of situation, so the group suddenly finds itself attacked or compromised, mm. and it responds like all groups do, with violence, or with, with an attempt to push out the invader, as it were. Um, and the, the, sad, the sad 
uh, the truth is that that sometimes ends in ends in really tragic cases. But it's wrong to call it senseless. It has mm. some kind of sense and meaning to it. And, and you also talked a lot there about, I suppose, and I think you gave the example of the boxing ring, right? And how that was uh, illegitimate like form of uh, violence and we're going to be looking at kind of different aspects in our in our film like video games and tv and yeah yeah what 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 do you think's the sort of like the cider in, in what makes something like a perfectly acceptable form of violence and something that makes something just completely past the pale and you know sort of not tolerated it seems like that's a bit fuzzy at times and yeah that's, so a, that's what we're trying to get sort of get out it's a good question i think we are still we're still juggling this i mean Violence has declined massively around the world. Violence is seen as increasingly unacceptable. That's state violence, that's, uh, that's you know, violence perpetrated by one state against another, which sadly we see in, you know, we, we see on a regular basis, but we've seen with Russia in invading Ukraine, that's a form of state violence. Um, but that is increasingly unacceptable. And interpersonal violence is also increasingly unacceptable. And the sanctions, the legal sanctions, are increasing against interpersonal violence. Mm. So the, uh, you're more likely now, if you punch the body in a pub, to get arrested for it um, than you were 20 years ago. And that's, that's, that kind of thing has led to this massive, plus um, you know, uh, a huge decline in poverty around the world, a massive rise in living standards. All of these mm. things have contributed to a massive decline in interpersonal violence, what we call interpersonal violence around the world. Um, at the same time, it's important to realise that violence is still kind of part of our everyday lives. So we define it socially, yeah. we define yeah. it legally, you know, our legal structures say what is and isn't violence. And it's really complicated, you know, it's, you know, if you look at the kind of martial arts, for instance, uh, a lot of martial arts stuff that's taught, you, it, you're only allowed to use it in very specific circumstances. Mm. You have to justify it in terms of self-defence, and that can be very difficult. So, um, so even our very complex overarching legal system still struggles to define what is and what isn't violence. Uh, and you know, somebody having a little bit of a, a push about on a Saturday night versus somebody being punched and falling backward, splitting his head open, and dying on a Saturday night. Mm. The line between those is very thin. It might be a couple of pints of beer. Uh, it might just be the person who punched him, who, who didn't come across, I remember reading the articles, as a particularly violent person. He's just got into a bit of a fight, uh, punched somebody in that place he's died. That He's gone to prison. So uh, both of those people's and their families' lives have changed massively through quite a small outbreak, outbreak of violence. It was important to speak to someone with a lived experience of violence. So next we meet Nathan, now an inspiring mentor at the St. Giles Trust, a charity that specialises in working with people who have come into contact with the criminal justice system. I go into schools all across the UK and basically speak to kids about not only knife crime, gang violence, realities of prison, CSC, which obviously is just a shortened acronym for child sexual exploitation. I use my lived experience because unfortunately I come from a checkered background where I was once a gang member, you know, I've sold drugs, I've been involved with guns and knives and that, and ultimately it sent me to prison for a very, very long time of my life. So I try, yeah, I try and use my lived experience in a sense to obviously, like I said, deter people from obviously making the wrong choices. Would I be comfortable telling you about my offender past? And of course, like I said, I've got to kind of do it in my day-to-day -day life. So it's, you know, you kind of get used to it now, you know, like before, yeah, I did find it hard because, mm. you know, unfortunately, um, what got me into prison, I actually committed a heinous crime. It's no easy way to kind of put it. Someone ended up losing their life. Being an ex-gang member, you get involved with certain things where you, I don't know, you're required to kind of, I don't know, put in work, as they would say on the road. And it means yeah. by any means necessary. Like you don't think about your consequences and of your actions kind of thing. Cut a long story short, when I was 18, I ended up getting arrested for murder. I spent nearly 15 years in prison. I ended up coming out of prison when I was 33 years of age. So I spent predominantly the whole entirety of my huge, later teens, older 20s within prison, within the uh, justice system. Mm -hmm. I've had to grow up and become a man within the justice system, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like I said, what attracted it to me, what attracted me to the role that I do, like I said, of course, I get the chance to make a change. Mm -hmm. 
give something back. When I go into the schools and I talk about knife crime per se, that's something that's obviously personal to me because albeit that I've mis manhandled and misused firearms in my past and dealt drugs, etc. When I talk to kids per se about county lines and say knife crime, I try to show them like, if any of you ever believe for a second that you're just going to be able to just take one thing like your phone, hand it over to someone, get money, get paid for it, it's just going to be scot-free, it's going to run smooth like that every single time, you're sorely mistaken. My offender history is not an extensive one, but my life kind of if what somewhat began if what I'm saying is when I was 18 and I got found guilty of murder, that's how my ex offender history kind of began, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a powerful story. And what, what, what I, I kind of like really liked about it as well is how you, I suppose you talked about, because like when, when, when people think about, you know, like committing a crime, they generally think of, you know, there's one, you know, one perpetrator, one, one kind of victim, but that's not, that's not, that's not life, is it? Like, of course. You know, Everyone, even the person who is convicted, is a is a is a, is a victim. But like you say, the family like it yeah. affects so many people's lives. Now that, 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 that kind of um, struck me in those fifteen years or so. Mm. The amount of people that I've seen have like some serious violence happen to them because they owe someone money or something like that. Because remember, you can't pay for drugs with cash with currency in it because no one doesn't have cash. So you may take stuff on. They call it tick but it's basically consigning something you consign an amount of drugs of someone or you borrow should i say with the promise that your people on the outside is going to pay your drug debt now say for instance you was my cousin and i said anton i need you to send 50 pounds to um sorry i forgot your cameraman you say his name is paul oh yeah yeah right anton i need you to send 50 pounds to paul by saturday yeah no problem nathan man i'd sort that out whatever whatever Come Saturday, if Paul hasn't sent that money into that person at all, they're putting untold pressure on me. They're telling me now I don't owe £50, I owe £100 because I've took longer than what I should have. And not only that, I don't know what your situation is on the outside. So I'm putting pressure on my family members, my friends on the outside to do that. I've seen so many people have to run to, like, this. they got a thing called the segregation unit, like the block. <laughs> and they've got to stay down there for weeks and months until they get moved to another prison in fear of their own safety because i may not personally come and attack you anton there's people in there where i could just say to someone i'll give you a hundred pound worth or there's a drug that they spoke in this prison from when i was in there called spice you may have heard of it before yeah 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 he was a huge problem you know, well. it's a very crazy joke like we used to call it the green crack because that's how people used to move. Like, it was crap, but it was, like, supposed to be a, a cannabis substitute. But how people move over it, they're moving like it's crap. So, basically, I can say to someone, I'll pay you hundred p £100 to go and boil up a kettle with hot sugar water and throw it in Anton's face. And people would jump at the chance to go and do stuff like that for £100 worth of spice. I don't even have to get my hands dirty. I've, I've, I've been assaulted several times. I've actually been burnt twice myself by someone boiling up hot kettle water and throwing it over me. I've had, like, my arm broke in prison. I've had, like, I've, like key sole surgery on my shoulder to, like, rebuild my whole shoulder. I've had people try to stab me. Unfortunately, I've done stabbings in there, so I've come in jail for knife crime, and I'm still using knives in prison or man or man-made knife, should I say. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, growing up in prison and my experience with prison has not been good at all, mate. And like I said, I wouldn't ever wash prison upon anybody. No, I, I, I mean, it was, it, was, it was quite powerful how you, I suppose, how you talked about how, because like, like my next question was going to be, obviously, what, you know, how is sort of violence used in that scenario? But, um, yeah, it, it seemed like it was, just, it was just an everyday sort of part of the fabric of your, yeah. your, 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 your sort of uh, existence. And, um, you know, it kind of, I suppose... People might be surprised at how um how would I phrase it how kind of like, almost like transactional kind of violence kind of mm -hmm. kind of like kind of like seems to to be and like it, it's not like censors it seems to be like violence was used for very specific like purposes so, like you know like 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 that system you said that social not 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 paying his debt or mm -hmm. um, it could be like you know like when you was in school and like like I said I just come back from working in a school about to, to in regards to bullying mm -hmm. and it's like. It could be as simple as someone's looking at you funny. Someone turns around and says, what are you looking at? 
if you just turn your back and just carry on walking off and don't bother respond, nothing's really going to escalate. But nine times out of ten, you're living in a bravado situation and a bravado environment like prison. Someone says, what are you looking at? You're going to say, like, shut up, such and such. Who, what you, who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? No, who are you talking What, you want to do something? And then they just powder kick. It's yeah. full of testosterone in there. I, I, can't, I can't believe where, where, where you are in your life, like, considering... Yeah, even man. just a few, few of the experiences that you've that, mm-hmm. that you talked about and I imagine that's the tip of the Plymouth iceberg so you know yeah, yeah it's, it's it's tremendous and I mean from from those acts of violence as well it would kind of it would kind of seem like you you would almost have no choice in some situations like I, I imagine like if you didn't act in a violent way following some sort of attack or something you know, you know is there like a like a, like a, a like perception of you being weak or something if you didn't exactly. respond to that sort of thing Exactly. You said it yourself, my friend. So it's like, if you don't seem to be standing up for not just yourself, but just for your friends, for what you believe in, of course, people's going to take you as a pushover. And that's kind of like in any way, shape or life. It's like, even like, like I said, 10, 15 years ago, my friend, the last time I was living, did I ever think I'd be sitting standing up in a room with like, doctors and first response paramedics and police officers and whatnot shaking hands and talking in a corporate environment like that about things that can obviously kind of make a change and whatnot because you know some people go through through a lot lot worse than i have my friend you know what i mean well, well i think you've been very very modest there but yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> i i mean um something that i would i would like to, to ask you about as well um and when 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 we kind of think about um, well, I suppose like violent crime more more generally, it is a you know overwhelmingly male kind of issue, right? There's almost almost no mm-hmm. women. Like if you were to compare both populations, why do you, why do you think it's such a kind of masculine kind of like issue? Like do you reckon there's a big gender part to play there? Um, I, I say I was saying that like from what I've experienced through working in schools and stuff mm. like that, and obviously being back out. Because remember, when you're in prison, you're just in like a, a containment, a bubble, should I say? Yeah, yeah. And when you come out, it's like there's always a generational shift. Yeah. So when I first went away, yeah, you would say it's predominantly more male orientated, the gang stuff and whatnot. But you start to find, especially in London, I don't know so much in like other cities in England. Yeah. But you know, I got family in Birmingham, etc females are putting in just as much work as the, on the roads and within gang stuff as males nowadays. Like, Interesting. Okay. It's been absolutely amazing. I just pleasure, thank, you. thank you for um, giving up your time today. And it's been really it's interesting. Pleasure. I wondered about violence at the group level, such as gangs. This is Sean. He is the director of Safer Now, an organisation that combats violence in a variety of contexts, such as gangs and criminality at the community level. In terms of like the types of violence you would see then, is it mostly gang violence that you tend to yeah. work with? I'm not sure if you would if you would think of it as types of violence, but then some, some something to do is just maybe to get a bit of a ground in there as to what. Sure. So so I, I then spent four years working hospital-based violence interruption. Oh, oh interesting. So violence interruption being we consider violence a um, like a communicable disease, sort of metaphorically. So if you plot so the spread of violence over time in a geographical area, yeah. it will look the same as cholera, it'll look the same as TB, it'll probably look the same as COVID. Oh, interesting, like a, just like a, yeah, like a public health. Uh, public health, exactly, yeah. yeah. Really. And, you know, it, it's on the a, on a baseline of it. If I come to your area and I harm you, mm. that's going to have an impact on you, your closest people, probably the wider people, because someone's been harmed in their area by someone in another area. And what we're doing here is just like, it's like one person coughing on the tube, you know? Yeah, yeah. They're then going to go visit other people. Patient zero, yeah. Patient zero, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and using that sort of public health approach, we're removing the, you know, the sort of, the, the morality of things, which I think sometimes makes it challenging to see what we can actually do about, about this topic. So in the hospital-based work, the violence that we saw, um, sort of the types of it, I suppose, it's all interpersonal. Um, there's a lot of sort of what people would consider gang and organised crime, and mm-hmm. urban street gang related stuff. Mm-hmm. But it all seemed to start off as like an interpersonal thing. I've not heard of, and there may well be some, but I'm not known of conflicts that might involve groups of people that didn't originally occur because of a one-on-one interpersonal beef or conflict. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So it's not like two gangs just exist and then they're like, oh, let's, let's war. Like, those gangs may well have formed because one person harmed another person in opposing areas and then their closest people got together. It just reminded me of like the uh, prison uh, sort of kind of like literature, I suppose, where it talks about damage to one's like reputation, right? Then it like, it kind of like necessitates a response, otherwise you might appear weak and be victimized or something like that. I'm not sure that's true in the work that you did, but that's definitely what I sort of come across in my research in it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think also, I think we as society can be a bit lazy with that idea mm -hmm. because if we're always like it's about reputation then that seems quite shallow you know reputation someone's own reputation is quite a shallow sort of prospect but it's a lot more about survival like reputation is a part of survival if you're living in an area where violence is prevalent prevalent where there is risk then reputation isn't just some ego thing reputation is the armor that you have it's the um, it's the way that enables you to safely walk somewhere. So I think, yes, reputation, but I think it's much deeper than just the, the word and how it's sort of surface level used. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, there's that in the aspect of like, yeah, literally like personal survival. And, and if you're in a situation as well where, um, I don't know, yeah, how, how, you're, how you're perceived by others could get you killed as well. In our film, we're, we're really trying to interrogate how violence is perceived in like, like, like popular culture. And how fair that kind of, un that kind of under understanding is. But there is like, this idea, right, that <clears throat> violence is like, I don't know, this kind of irrational outburst, right? That's just like, like, you know, to like that kind of like that fog of war, right? There's so many sayings in our society, like, you lose your mind, you get into the rage, you don't let rage be your master. <laughs> All these things are being totally irrational. Um, and I, yeah, what we're trying to get to the bottom, bottom of is whether that's fair. I, I maybe bring in a bit of a a nuance or nuanced understanding of it. So like, would you agree that violence is just this irrational, senseless thing? Or, yeah, in your experience, talk, do you agree with that? I would say there's, there's two parts to this. So the sort of the, the outburst that you mm. mentioned, this sort of red mist thing, comes from what we might consider amygdala hijacking. Mm. So um, a really simple way to describe it is uh, you sort of put your hand up like that and your thumb underneath uh, your, fork, your fingers, yeah. that this is like your amygdala. And it's the thing that keeps you alive, irrelevant of the consequences. And it's part of your limbic brain, so it's like it's survival responses. Mm. Uh, it's a bit, it's, I sometimes think of it like a, it's almost like alien like in language, because you can say like its vessel being your body, mm. it needs to carry on living. And therefore, it is going to take over in times of absolute crisis, in times of absolute survival. Now, some, you know, super, super evolved, but really, really old part of our brain that this is, isn't going to be, you know, doesn't have the capacity and isn't going to be thinking about the social outcomes of committing violence, right? Yeah, it's just an appropriate action to be doing right now, yeah. And its purpose is not <laughs> yeah. to, because if you, if you wait to think about those things, there's a chance you're going to lose your life. Mm. Right, so it's the thing, it's the fight or flight, it's the fight, flight, freeze, flop and friend section of our brain. Yeah. So there is this thing called amygdala hijacking that it sort of takes over momentarily to do what needs to be done. Mm. Which isn't a conscious thought, which comes somewhat into conflict with the idea of free will in terms of these, these sort of uh, scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. um, but on a broader sense, Yes, of course, there are senseless acts of violence, like irrational acts of violence that might occur. Um, but within my sort of career, the, the people I work with, the young people, the young adults who are living to survive each and every day, there's nothing sort of irrational about it. If we think about the context in which these people live, in which these young people that we're talking about, or I'm talking about, harm is everywhere. And therefore, this idea of reputation that we said that it's a, it's a shield. The weak get preyed on, could be something that's considered on the streets. The same as in prisons, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, you have to be a certain way to be able to defend yourself. And sometimes one's trying to catch up to the other. So like, I might have a reputation which supersedes my sort of conscious decision-making ability to be violent in scenarios, right? Does that make sense? Kind of like which one's trying to fight for the position. Then. Yeah, so I might have to do things to sort of add up to my to the social sphere's understanding of how violent I am or how 
uh, protected I am or how yeah. like, ready I am to commit to violence. Um, but these are the things that happen day in, day out for people. Mm. Going to the shops, I went to the shops this morning, I didn't need to worry about anything at all. You know, there's this sort of subtle layer that I might be carrying, you know, my phone and, and whatever in my bag that I'd love not to have stolen. But that's like some unspoken thing that isn't causing me any impact. If I have to walk to the shop because my basic needs have to be met and it's just a human thing to do, yet I know either subconsciously or consciously that I could never get home after that. How are we expecting people to behave in what we consider palatable and rational? or irrational. Mm -hmm. I would say from their context, from their perspective, it is all rational. It is rational and logical. We want to stay alive. And sometimes, to stay alive, we might decide that we have to go and do something to, okay. to neutralise a threat somewhere else. So it seems that you are suggesting then that it, um, not always, but violence can serve a real function, right? I, I would say that violence, almost always serves a function for the perpetrator. But if people are put in positions where there's nothing left to do other than that extreme step, yeah. I don't know what we expect to happen. Yeah. Even violence is a form of communication. Ab it's absolutely a form of communication. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for speaking with me today. Pleasure. Well, it's, been, uh, it's been enlightening. Amazing, <laughs> thank you very much. Now that we have a good grounding of violence, I wonder how it is perceived in our popular culture e.g. music and video games. We'll now hear from Daniel Buxton, an experienced vocalist, musician and sound engineer, voicing his own experiences of the role of violence and aggression in heavy metal. So we met in the sort of heavy metal sort of gigging scene uh, in you know, various bands and things like that, so we've both been in it for a long time, so... <laughs> So, I mean, it, 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 it was not like an obvious one for us really to kind of explore heavy metal. There's quite quite an uh, interesting history in terms of how it's really perceived. You know, it, 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 I mean, throughout its history, it's been, um, you know, sort of criminalised in many ways and, and, and viewed as, you know, and... and uh, I, think, I, think, I think the iconography has been an easy jumping point for um, public opinion, for sure, as well, with regards to the kinds of imagery and the subjects and the... Mm. Um, Details in the lyrical content, for example, that deal with often quite, shall we say, mature content. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that you know, um, I don't, know, I'm not sure if aggressive is the right word, but you know, some would say are quite offensive lyrics. You know, is, is one part of that, and obviously, it's you know, there's the the links there to religion. Uh, you know, of, you know, there's sort of like a accusations that heavy metal is like related to the cults, and you know, worship of 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 all sort of satanic sort of things like that. Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I mean, really, we're kind of you know trying to get to grips of well, one, how how founded is is uh, heavy metal's connection with with uh, violence? So, you know, just off off the top of my head, you know, the kind of like historically things like like uh, Columbine, for example, you know, with the links there with uh, you know like Marilyn Manson at that time. Yeah, I, I can remember when that came out and the uh, you know like the the church burnings from the 90s. Um, Black Sabbath before that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, as, as someone who's you know immersed in that world yourself, you know, obviously he's made the music and you know, played with numerous bands and things like that. What's your kind of view on, on the popular culture around uh, heavy metal and violence? I think there's definitely a symbiotic relationship between the actual intention or perhaps... Um, desire from the lyrical content, from the dress, from the imagery concerned around metal to perhaps lean towards violent aspects of human nature. It certainly explores a lot of the darker concepts, a lot more of the emotional content that perhaps is for for one way or another some some kind of unspoken or untreadable ground by some people when it comes to more popular forms of um, music or genres that would normally deal with more, I suppose, relatable subjects or things that are often spoke about in general day-to-day -day discourse. And I feel that a lot of it is misinterpreted by external forces. You see on the face of it, black clothing, heavy guitars, big drums, screaming vocals, 
lots of words that you might pick out specifically in the screaming that you haven't really adjusted your ears for or perhaps don't really care to even try. Was it was it Judas or Twisted Sister where they had to like, like defend themselves in court law, right? The I do comment. The, was yeah, that, was where, that the where they were like interpreting like like, like demonic verses on Yes, the... so apparently there were messages in Judas Priest's music where, yeah. where it was saying do it effectively yeah, okay. to relate yeah, yeah, to yeah. suicide um mm -hmm. which was um a, about a certain individual who had taken their life who was apparently very interested in judas priest and you know really heralded heralded them above all else yeah, yeah. but I, I i think a big part of this is percep perception based and interpretation from the outside it can seem to be something that it's not i, I feel as well that with with things like metal it's um it's perhaps a vehicle or a way in which people can vent certain feelings or frustrations that may be deemed socially unacceptable, especially considering that the majority of people who interact with metal are white middle class men. Perhaps metal and alternative countercultures provide a platform for people to do that in relative security because you have that unwritten understanding with everyone present that it's okay here. Yeah, and kind of, you kind of get that there that, that it's been used to challenge existing power structures, kind of like, kind of like you know, sort of like like within our society, like, like it's almost like a form of a resistance. Uh, so I suppose not too dissimilar to the Sex Pistols movement, the punk movement. Mm -hmm. if, if it's about crossing, you know, like you know, sort of like you know, boundaries itself, right? You, you can kind of see there's almost a like competitive like element there. So yeah, you know, if you have. And those who don't know, like heavy metal, they, they, you know, there's a joke that, that there's more genres than our actual fans, right? There's so many <laughs> roots of, of of metal. You're not wrong. Oh yeah, all competing for, um, you know, I, I don't know. I suppose like a space, as it were. Or, or... And, and within that, you know, you have your own almost subcultures within the counterculture. Well, I suppose I'd like to know, since you're obviously you're an experienced musician yourself, and you're a vocalist, and you know we we share the stage once 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 or twice. What is it that kind of aggression? Because you can't really deny that there is you know, like an element of aggression and violence at heavy metal, you know, gigs. I mean, you know, obviously from the from, in terms of the aggression, you know, from the actual artists, you know, the heavy, heavy, just sort of guitars and the vocals. But even even from the fans as well. You know, obviously we're talking about pain and um, you know, I mean, I mean, walls of death. You don't tend to see them much anymore. Yeah. Um, but you know, there, there, there's an obvious. And that term itself is kind of coining some violence yeah, there, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's undeniable. It's undeniable. So I want to have like an honest conversation about that. Um, what I suppose what function is aggression serving for you first as as an artist? Then, if you want to broaden out a little bit, it's up to you. But what's it doing for the, you? The 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 incredible thing that I think is probably best to start with is I actually underwent um, personal therapy a few years ago. But since therapy, I haven't done any metal vocals. I felt no desire or need to do so. And the reason why I thought it was important to say that first is because, to answer your question, violence or that uncertainty or that friction or that incoherence, whatever you want to call it, was like an infinite, infathomable well of fuel mm. for the fire, effectively. And I always said to anyone who asked me about my stage performance, because I tend to be quite dramatic, I, Get very into it. I like to get down on my knees, and, yeah. you know, fall on my back, and um, almost act act out these things I'm experiencing. And people would always ask me, you know, what advice have you got, kind of thing. And I'd, I'd have to tell them I I can't really tell you because when I get in those moments, I'm I'm not me. You know, I'm I'm just a different person. Yeah, same for me. It's like an alter ego almost. Yeah. 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 And looking back on it now through the lens of therapy, I realised the reason why I did that was because. I was allowed, it was, it was an acceptable premise or foundation for me to experience that which I was unaware of and use it mm. as, a, as a show of sorts, effectively. What do you think is going on in terms of like the, like the fans then? Because I, speaking as a fan, when I see that type of, type of aggressive performance, I am definitely connecting with it on, on, on a quite a primal level I think and there's something going on it's, I mean maybe for some people it's a bit more intellectual maybe um, but for me I, I try not to intellectualise it at all for me it's just something I feel mm. uh, I've, I've always had that, that connection with it and, I've, and I, I, I've seen you play, you know, play live numerous times and you have that you know when you're displaying this this is a good, aggressive but passionate kind of uh, vocal style and would you say I'm an aggressive person 
Not at all. No, could not be further from the truth. That's why it's right. so interesting to explore. I so. wouldn't say that about myself either, but hey ho, put me on the stage mm. with that fire in my belly and you know, wind me up and watch me go. <laughs> I think from the audience perspective themselves, you, you have different types of fans, don't you? You have people who are very techy, very um, geeky, perhaps labelled purists, I suppose, um, in some respects, who just go to, you know, really stand at the back, watch the shows. They're looking for well-delivered, well-executed, well-performed shows, and that's their experience, right? They want to enjoy a good performance. Then you have individuals who will gravitate to the front or, you know, closer to the stage who are a bit more interested in the energy, you know, feeling the, the woof of the subs and perhaps may, maybe or maybe not getting involved in whatever uh, violence may ensue yeah, <laughs> in terms of a, a pit or a, a wall of death, as you mentioned earlier. <clears throat> but, the ni but the nice thing about these points here is that the, these are very horrible, aggressive sounding names for things where someone falls down and they get picked up straight away, you know? Like there, there's a camaraderie, there's a community even in these frustrations and these outlets. Do you think that it would be a good idea to, you know, like remove any 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 degree of, of, of violence or aggression or would that be a, a beneficial thing or is it sort of like inherent? Because I suppose what I'm trying to get, you know, is, is, is violence or aggression in particular context, is it inherently good or bad? You know, or, is it, is it, or, or, or can it just serve a purpose? Mm. Um, you know, would, you, would you even want to make metal less aggressive, for example? Or would you lose, lose what makes it metal? I don't know. I think because everyone within the counterculture is accepting that there is no intent behind the violence, I think it's okay to leave it. I think taking away that element of controversy removes the freedom for those to express their frustrations in that manner. If you take that away, you're basically saying it's not okay, which I think would clam people up. I think the whole point of alternative culture is to be against that which is deemed doctrine, as it were, to deemed mandatory can have a different way of looking at things yeah. you can you can express things differently next we have ben an academic researcher that delves into the often highly controversial and criticized musical world of drill could you maybe start um, by giving us a bit of a, a kind of a grounding as to what drill and kind of like grime music is for those of us who are uh, well like me uh, who don't know about the form music because yeah. we've, we've already kind of looked at um kind of attitudes and uh, the sort of culture ideas around heavy metal, so mm. it'd be quite interesting to, you know, to hear from this side. So maybe start off there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, drill and grime are kind of subgenres of UK urban music. Mm. Um, grime predates drill, so that that came first and kind of was born out of the jungle garage kind of era yeah. in the UK. Um, and it had some major players, Wiley, Dizzy Rascal, are kind of the major names in in, in the formation of it. Uh, and that's really grown into a commercial genre where now we have the likes of Skepta and Stormzy, uh, some of the most kind of notable names uh, at the forefront of grime. Um, and then after that, we had drill music come. So uh, what we saw was the commercialization of grime. So it was taken as an underground music, which then mm -hmm. went into kind of more of the pop scene. And then to represent the people again, we see the emergence of drill music, which is again, a more raw underground form of uh, music. Um, drill music specifically is linked to violence. So the name drill comes from the term drilling, uh, which is shooting. Um, people in, 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 in within okay. their language. Right, okay. So, the, the, so, to, yeah. So to be a driller is you are a shooter. Drilling is shooting. Um, so drill music is specifically based around violence. Uh, it actually originated in Chicago with an artist called Chief Keef, um, who brought out drill music. It was then adopted by the UK and has then been transported back to New York. So now we have New York drill, which is based a lot on UK drill, and it would be considered a music of black origin. So it comes from kind of black music, the hip hop, rap kind okay. of world. Well, okay, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So how would you say that like drill and grime, because 
for, for my point of view, it does have a bit of a, rep, a bit of a reputation, which is why I, obviously I've selected that one. It'd be a great song to go into. Yeah. Not dissimilar to heavy metal in many ways. So, yeah. could you maybe start with like, just give us a how 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 is it perceived? Obviously, we can get to the reasons and whether yeah. whether that's justified in it in a bit. Mm -hmm. How is it perceived by kind of media? And so I think that well, uh, so there you just clarified quite an important bit at the end. I think we have different people who perceive it obviously in yeah. different ways. So we've got the people right at the core of the music experience and the socio-economic con context that's then informing the music and they're kind of right at the heart of the music. Um, then we have the wider public who tend to be informed by mainstream media on the opinions of, of, of trends that they don't understand. So they'll get their information from, from newspapers and stuff like that. When we see mainstream media document uh, drill music, mm. it's very it highlights the violence a lot. That's the main thing is that drill music is this violent music. But the general perception is from the media that that drill music is considered a violent music, um, and from the people within it, it's an expression of their social context. I just bagged a knife for my young G, now I'm in Dior, just copping the store. And the pigs on me still watching so Play a G before you buy it, we the runners gotta run it by me. Hey, still my provider gun, shotgun, two cases, two operations done. Listen, tap it, close one, I am burning. I think it's really a complicated situation where the media is simply saying we need to ban drill music completely uh, misses all the nuances of the okay. argument. So, so, so I'm assuming by that you don't feel that their criticisms are, are justified, shall we say? So, yes, they are. If, if the criticism is... Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. If, if the criticism is that drill music is violent, then yes, absolutely. Fundamentally, by its definition, it is violent because, as I said, it, it's about drilling. So, by its definition, it is violent. My issue is with the argument that it causes the violence and that causality, uh, one, can't be proved and two, is detrimental to creating any real change because if you believe it's the music causing it, you're not doing the social things of putting in youth clubs or putting in these things because the issue is the music, not the, the conditions. From, from, so, so from, from someone who's completely outside this world as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, we're, we're sort of looking at how violence is um, used and rep represented in different media forms and stuff like that. Yeah. How how exactly is violence used in drill and crime music? In what ways do you see it, like themes or symbology or whatever? Talk 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 us through that. So you're the the normal. Uh, so obviously it's in the lyrics and it's in the videos as well. So um, the in the lyrics, it's not so much that the violence is used in the lyrics but that the lyrics are representing the violence that's in these people's lives and mm. um, so and this is why it's important to kind of define again the, the the real kind of target audience of who we're talking about if we're talking about people from these socio-economic low socio-economic places where crime is rife the, the, all of the the trappings of crime and, and stuff mm. are, are rife in these areas and we're saying they're expressions of of what they're going through. So they might have had to have stabbed someone in a, in a gang beef, and then they've documented that on the track to say, "Don't mess with me, because I'll stab someone." Because they have stabbed someone, and so they're sending out a warning to everybody else in the area: "This is who I am. This is what I'm capable of." And so it's a real kind of transmission of identity of through what they do. So, uh, so, so it, it it could prevent them from being attacked. In it in creates, way. yeah, you're creating, you use music to create your image. Mm. So one of the things, so the research that I'm specifically looking at is social identity theory, which proposes the idea of group prototypes. So group prototype is the ideal member for that particular group or that particular area or context. Mm. And that there are traits linked to that group prototype. So for example, in um, a, a um, art class, for example, the, the leader might be the person who can draw the best or who understands colours the best or and is able to relay those ideas to people and is able to be inclusive and, and that might be what is most effective to make them a group prototype within that group. 
what we have for these young people in these areas is the traits which make them successful include aggression and violence. So in these areas, to be a group prototype, to be somebody who survives this area and actually flourishes in this area, then aggression is a necessary trait in order to survive the social context that they're in. So that gives us two options then. Either we can look at that and go, aggression is bad, you shouldn't use violence and stuff like that, or we can look at the social context and say we need to change that so that violence isn't a necessary trait in order for them to survive. It's it kind of really interesting that you kind of hint, hint at that because um, what we've been looking at you know, kind of, well, different areas within obviously like pop, you know, pop, popular culture where violence is seen, um, which I get to that nugget of like what violence is for, mm -hmm. um, you know, is it, whether it's an entirely a negative thing or whether you can use aggression for, for all sorts of things, maybe you have to in certain kind of spaces. Yeah. We have spoke to, to, you know, to, one, to, to one guy now who works as a, a mental, he was, he was incarcerated himself, yeah. and, and talks about his, his, his experience while, while, while inside it. He talks quite a lot about like, violence as, as, as almost a shield, I would yeah. say. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, absolutely. Interesting. It's, it's really interesting the way you talk about there with, with Brown and Joe, that it seems to be almost like that, like you create this reputation to protect yourself from it. Absolutely, absolutely, exactly the same as prison. I mean, the, the, I mean, the environments are, uh, prison is a very heightened environment, but it's, it's replicated in these areas. The same sort of hierarchy based on strength um, is, is, still, is still replicated in the actual area rather than the prison. So, yeah, you still have the guy at the top is the strongest guy because anybody who challenges him, he has to beat. So it's kind of, by default, whoever's at the top has to be the strongest because they're constantly getting challenged for that position. So if you can create an element of fear around you or an element of untouchability through music by suggesting that mm. I'm this guy and I do this and I do that, then yeah, you'll create. I mean, it can backfire. People get challenged. They create a, a, an image that they can't uphold, and they get challenged on that image, and then obviously they're on the worst end of that because yeah, they're not, yeah, they don't right. actually support the thing. So, so now that you've have you kind of docu you sort of documented you know, what it is, and mm -hmm. you know how how they use the different forms as a society, how how do we reconcile the fact that? It is inherently violent on, on the one side, mm -hmm. but we also need to respect people's ability to, to express themselves, to express their truth, mm -hmm. uh, and and, it, and it, it's a different one because I, I don't want to kind of like skirt the issue. Like, like yeah. it, it is there is inherent problematic violence there too. Yeah. Um. Yeah. What's the what, what's the answer there? Yeah. So I think no, no pressure there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just solve all the world problems. <laughs> Give me hunger after yeah, and I'll yeah. answer that point. No. So I think you've got to kind of, uh, may, you've got two major things with that. One is that it is the expression, but it's really, what people are concerned about are not with the people expressing themselves, but are oh, concerned with Johnny from suburban Middle England, who yeah. is now carrying a knife because of the music that he's heard. That's, okay, that's, yeah. where, that's where the fear mongering comes in. That's where the whole issue is. It's not in these guys living their life and expressing themselves. It's how that may influence the wider, the wider public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, kind of alluding to what we were saying before about kind of violence being a natural part of humanity. For me, it's not how do we get rid of the violence, but it's how do we get people to understand violence and how do we teach them so, uh, I mean, one thing that's massively beneficial for young people uh, are kind of boxing clubs and sports clubs, which take the aggression, the energy, and, and hone it into a productive thing. Well, thank you very much for sharing your time. Today. That's all right. Thank, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we talk with Dr. Rachel Coet, who is a research psychologist and lead researcher of the non profit organization Take This. She specialises in video games, the health risks of the gaming space, and the risk of extremism. Um, we are um, basically exploring the role of, of violence with, you know, within popular culture and, and I suppose society more generally. Yeah. And, and I wanted to kind of uh, include a, a few kind of different, uh, you know, sort of like the different aspects of our culture, like music, um, like video games, things like that, because obviously it's, 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 they're, they're, they're huge industries. It's what we spend a lot of our time doing. Um, Yes, obviously that's why we're speaking with you. So I thought maybe for the first one, if I, if I could ask, why do you think that um, games more generally kind of have that 
almost moral panic, like triggering kind of thing thing that happens. It, it's it's you know it's it's kind of like that almost like so like Socratic kind of like they're corrupting the youth kind of kind of thing, right? And I'm just wondering what your thoughts as to why video games in particular seems to trigger that response in the same way that it has with heavy metal and forms of music. Sorry, right. Yeah, you know, video games come from a long line of the moral panics that came before them. So comic books, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, if you go really far back, even the written word um, had a moral panic about it. It's like, oh, no, people will no longer remember things because they'll be writing them down. And, and that's, you know, this problem. And we see it every once in a while when there's a new technological advancement that comes and everyone says, oh, this must be the core of something that is terribly wrong with society. And games are just the latest in a long line of the ones to come before them. But what's unique about games and the moral panic about games is that it's lasted so long. We've been seeing it for about 50 years. And I don't think we're gonna move beyond this idea of video games being you know, the bane of society until a new technology overtakes it. Like if virtual reality becomes more prolific mm -hmm. and more affordable, for instance, then we might see the discussion move on and it'll no longer be like, oh, these 2D games are wrong. It's the 3D immersive games that are wrong. Wrong. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah. I mean, I've heard that there was a similar thing when, like, the uh, uh, like uh, printing press came out, and people were like, "Oh my God, people yes. are going to be reading too many words." Um, too many words. There were crossword puzzles. Uh, there was a moral panic that women would become literate because they were at home doing crossword puzzles, and that would just be awful. <laughs> Sorry, that's a hilarious. Song. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so, uh, I mean, I suppose what's interesting is like ordinarily when you have these like moral moral panics, it's like a I don't know, like a subculture or something, right? Like a, I don't know, like a, generally it's like a small minority that kind of transgresses some invisible barrier. But the weird thing about video games, like, it's huge. Like, the, you know, the vast majority of the pop like, of the population. So, like, we're so far past that stereotype of, you know, the nerd nerd in the basement playing. Like, everyone plays video games. It's, I suppose that's that, that's why I can't get my head around it. That's why it still can cause that reaction despite it being so mainstream, right? Widespread. Yeah, I think there's maybe still a difference between a player and a gamer. Because mm. like you say, everybody plays games. My mom plays Wordle daily. Um, and she would rather, you know, die than be called a gamer ever. Um, and I think we do still have this stereotype. We see it in popular culture still all the time about this overweight, socially isolated game gamer which we know doesn't have any weight in in research we've, we've researched this time and again there's no social differences between people who play games and people who do not which probably doesn't come as a surprise because everybody plays games so why would we see differences in between them so i agree with you it does seem odd that it remains so heavily stereotyped as an activity maybe it's because it's mainstream now but it started as niche and we're just like holding on to that kernel of nicheness that it that it began with but um i too would have thought that we would have moved on by now so would you say because i know i know that you work a lot within the area of you know sort of i suppose like the crossroads between psychology and well-being and video games um, and yes. you know which obviously crisscrosses with you know like the potential violence and things like that without you know um i don't want i don't want to and sort of give credence to the to the stereotype, as it were, around video games and violence. But is there genuine threat there? Like, what's the level of genuine threat there? And um, you know, with you know, with with reference to the work that you've been doing, because I know that you work a bit in, in extremism. So, yes, yes, there's a lot of concern about video game violence and the impact it has on the player. And the concern tends to be rooted in this idea that if you engage in simulated violence in an interactive way through games. A person who has no propensity for violence will then somehow transform into somebody with a propensity to, for violent crime. And that's patently false. There's been thousands of studies. We've studied it for 20 years. There are no direct links between engaging in violent media, games included, and committing real world violent crime. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, you know, the experiences we have, our media experiences, can and do impact the way we see and engage within the world. And that can include violent content, explicit content, and video games, just as it can include, you know, certain books with certain ideologies um, that are held within within their pages. So I, I don't think we need to make kind of these patent claims that it has no effect, but it definitely does not have the effect that people are afraid that it has. It definitely does not have a uniform, broad, wide-sweeping impact on the people who are engaging in them. 
do you think that because it's something that, that, that I've, I've really kind of like struggled with is you know I'm, like you I'm a I'm an academic a, a researcher you know I spend, I spend my life in books I'm a complete pacifist I don't like the idea of, of, <laughs> of hurting anyone um, yeah. like, like most people that play that that, uh, that that play video games but there there is something that I'm getting from you know playing games like that you know like like you know Call of Duty or or, mm-hmm. or, or things like that so part of me is like you know that the violence or aggression in the in these videos in these video games are doing something for me as a, as a human. You know, I'm, I'm I'm expressing <laughs> something. I, I don't I don't know. I'm not sure if I have the language for it, but you know, is it is it doing something for us? Uh, yeah. If I, if if I, if I'm making any sense at all, um... you are making sense. I mean, there's there's two ways to think about why we find these kinds of game violent games so enjoyable. Um, and it's not just violent games. I'm going to use Among Us as an example. Uh, we call it transgressive play. So Among Us, it does have some violent content, right? You're murdering the other little space beans. Um, but it's mostly about lying to your friends, which is also not a socially acceptable thing that we should be doing. Okay. But it's fun to lie to your friends in a space where it's socially sanctioned, where you know it's playful, where you know that everyone has come to the space to engage in that, that activity. So the same could be said for going in a round of a fortnight, you know you're not actually shooting other people, but you're engaging in a healthy competition and you're doing something that in the real world you know would be wrong and, and you would very much not do. But there's something enjoyable about engaging in that activity in a safe environment where it's not going to have real world repercussions. I mean, the example I like to give is Grand Theft Auto. I don't like playing Grand Theft Auto because I, I don't like the pressure of being chased by the police. <laughs> I don't like any games that have like time pressure. Like I really don't like it. Yeah, it's but very I, um, <laughs> I run, I run over terribly. I'm a terrible driver on GTA and I run over pedestrians in GTA all the time. And I, you know, don't feel bad about it because it's a game and they're not real people and I'm not actually running them over and I'm not going to get into my car and drive poorly and run over mm-hmm. pedestrians. But there's something enjoyable about being able to engage in a space where, you know, it's not real. Our brains are really good at differentiating between what's real and what's not. The other thing I want to mention is um, if we want to go Freudian, there is a term called sublimation, which is uh, uh, one of the classic defense mechanisms that Freud talked about in his work. And it's the idea that you take these unacceptable impulses or behaviors and you express them in a more socially accessible way. So a classic example would be like, if you're angry, you create a painting and you get your anger out in that painting. Well, if you've had a long day and you're really stressed out, you know what might be really relaxing? Playing around Fortnite with people um, and achieving success and having a really good round and, and, you know, changing your mood from one that's like really stressed out and had a hard day to one that's more happy and exhilarating. and, And, you know, games are really good at stress relief. So we can think about games also serving that function, the mood management function, through this idea of sublimation. It doesn't mean you're going to go out and, and shoot to mm. do some stress. I'd just like to thank you very much for giving yes. it your very, very busy schedule to talk. Very to welcome. Today. Thank you very yeah. much. It was not the intention of this film to in some ways legitimise violence. But what this film did do was bring some nuance to quite a controversial debate around violence and aggression more generally. We've seen how it can be a way of communicating when all other options fail you, a means of transgressing certain social norms and boundaries, and even a way of protecting yourself from potential victimization. The stakes are too high to take a simplistic view on violence. As a society, I feel our response must always take into account that human complexity and reflect the wider social context of those performing acts of aggression and violence, violence, violence.